in that, as far as the rest of them did, what I did was I intimidated a lot of people. Person like go. All right, I'm not taking this anymore. We're so recording live. Here, that I baby. Can't get this Where's shit my hat? Closed. Welcome. So you don't have a hat. hat. Welcome to Lighter Studios, the Wrestling with Rip Rogers show, and we've got a huge guest today, Rip. Hey, what do you mean? Call, the, you calling the, our guest fat or what? No. You said he was huge. Not not that kind of. No, huge like he's that. he's he's shredded. He's striated. He's in shape. And you're saying he's huge. Okay, you can announce today. You can take over. Give us the big intro today, Rip. With the teeth in or teeth out, it doesn't matter. Let oh, oh out no, there. no, you're Mr. No, uh, you're Dr. Mr. Tom Pritchard. Welcome to Lila Studios and Wrestling with Rip Rod. Well, 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 thank you very much, guys. Pleasure to be with you. And Rip is, uh, as usual, his, his happy uh, <clears throat> go lucky self. I like that. Oh, so you do uh, know your hair. Oh, oh, I've known Rip for years. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's awesome. How's his hair looking? He's always worried about his awesome. hair. Look, Rip, you look great. I look, I, I'm not dead, so, you know, when I'm fucking dead, I'll be sitting there going, ah. God, you just dropped an F-bomb in the first 30 did, seconds. Did I? Now I edit no, it it's got to be already. No, Can't did I say it? Did yeah, I say right F-bomb? Away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's Holy, it. I didn't even know I did. Yeah, you yeah. are allowed to use profanity. I mean, I, I do this show with Rip, so it's, you know, you know how Rip is. Uh, well, I, 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 I. I'm trying to limit my profanity as much as I can, but you know, sometimes teaching wrestling doesn't always allow that. Yep. I understand that. Um, yeah, coaching some people doesn't, in fact, it requires it at times. I think so. Um, I don't, today's world, maybe not as much, but uh, definitely back then. Yes. It was, uh, it was pretty much a given in the, uh, in the, in the wrestling world. So thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming on here. I'll tell you what, Everybody, everybody I've ever talked to, or everything I've ever read, everything I've ever seen, everybody says that Dr. Tom is one of the nicest guys in the wrestling business. I'm not sure I've ever seen anything bad about you anywhere. How does that make you feel? Well, let me let me just let me let me just stop you right there because, okay. <laughs> because you know what, man, I I have tried my best to um, to to be <laughs> encouraging, positive. <laughs> and, <laughs> As as Rip is choking on his food, but but you know, I mean, uh, I realized uh, just this week <laughs> talking to some people, I wasn't very nice, and I didn't mean, and I'm trying to be very nice and a lot more nicer than I was. But uh, I I I think the sign of a good coach is just just to get the point across and be encouraging and make them get the message across make them receive your message, whatever it is. But, oh, my gosh, I don't know if I'm the nicest guy. That's for sure. Uh, compared to a lot of people out there, I'm a pussycat. But, but uh, no, I don't think I'm uh, – anyway, but but it makes me feel good that people think that, believe that. Hey, you guys are in Batman's – or you're in the Riddler's lair because you guys are going sideways. Yeah, I just uh, unplugged Rip's mic on accident here. Try oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry about that. I, you know, I've I've always uh, heard how nice you were, and I've met you a couple times, whether you remember or not. And uh, you were always very, very good to me. But that was also coming out of being in Rip's class uh, before I was in your class. So maybe, maybe it was just comparing uh, you to Rip Rod. Yeah, that 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 could have been it. Could have been the the the, the ruler was or or the uh, yardstick was was just a little crazy that day. But anyway, no, I try to. I don't try to be that mean, but sometimes I, I guess I come across that way. I've heard that that uh, I can be uh, a little cantankerous at times. But we all have bad days, or bad years, or bad centuries, decades, whatever you want to say. Bad lives, maybe. Bad lives, maybe could be. Bad motherfucking life. Yeah. <laughs> There's what? another one you have to edit. I just read an interview with. Uh, Ozzy Osbourne, and, and they preface it by saying he said the word F over 540 times in three hours. They counted. They took the time to count how many times he said, you know. I believe that for sure. When oh, we, I do too. I do too. So When we were starting this in the, in the the kind of in the beginning and, and people told us that YouTube, um, you know, kind of frowned on the, on the F-bombs all the time, I, I took two segments out of, of one of our shows we did. And it was, uh, I think it was like 60 sometimes in a minute and then 40 sometimes in a minute for Rip. So that's in a good. minute, in a minute, in yeah. a minute. Yeah, it sounds about right. <laughs> so it was uh, between the F-bombs and the, and, the, and the GDs, those two. Yeah. 
combined. Um, so yeah, after that, we did try to tone it down a little bit. It's been it's been tough on him, but we're, we're hey, well. and then then there was it was a backlash when I started saying poop yeah, and stuff. That, yeah, yeah, they didn't like. Then all of a sudden, they wanted they wanted profanity. It's a, it's a fickle audience, Rip. It's a fickle I mean, if audience. anybody can make people wanting profanity back, it's. You know, me. you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, they say if you if you swear a lot, that just it, it's a lack of intelligence. No, they said uh, the I, people that swear a lot <laughs> are smarter. That's my point. Because when they said that to me, I said, "Well, f you. I don't give a damn what you yeah. think." So there you go. That's awesome. Yeah, so we're not gonna we're not gonna do a whole life story here. Um, but I I do like to do a lot of first at least um, for for me personally. And so if, if we could kind of take us back to, to growing up, did you always want to be into, into the wrestling business? I think I've read that before on you. And, and kind of back then, there wasn't really, um, you know, there wasn't tryout camp so much. Maybe there was a little bit, but there wasn't NXT. There wasn't FCW, that kind of stuff. How did you get into the wrestling business? How did you even know where to start? Well, I didn't know where to start, but I always loved wrestling from the first time I saw it, man. And I, I was born, grew up in El Paso, Texas. Uh, and then when I was 10 years old, we had to move to Houston, Texas. And my dad had a, uh, job working. I think it was a, at an employment agency in El Paso. Then he got a better job. And we had to move to Houston. So we didn't get a chance to go to the matches too much in El Paso. They were on Monday night school nights. And, uh, but I followed it from day one. Then we got to Houston. Uh, we found Houston wrestling and Paul Bosch. And new wrestlers, Johnny Valentine, Wahoo McDaniel, Gary Hart, Jose Lothario. But this was right around the time Dory Funk Jr. won the championship. And uh, so I we, we it, Friday night in the Coliseum, uh, my mom wanted to get out of the house. And uh, tickets were five bucks. So she could take Bruce and me, uh, get out of the house, make a carton of daiquiris back then i guess you could bring in Came stuff to the to the, to the uh, uh to the matches and uh are, are you are you do you have ways on your phone rip rip rip's got his uh gps up um, right you yeah just gotta... are you, you trying to find your way around the room <laughs> well i was trying to get a, a different way here and <laughs> yeah it was taking me 189 <laughs> miles the other way but so I, yeah, oh. that, the, everything was wrong on the robot. Everything. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Go to Waze, W A Z E, and it'll get you there. there you you know, but but you might have typed in the wrong place. If you're no, right. I didn't. I'm thinking that's no. I was. I was. It says you're still 22 miles away. I think maybe yeah. you put in the wrong address. No, I. I well, I, I said it to Siri. I don't know how many times. What a Siri. bitch she. What a bitch she was. <laughs> I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't Wait. understand. Uh, well. Then Maybe. I told the robot to suck my motherfucking dick. <laughs> <laughs> and she says, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, you, you need to make it clear, and obviously you did. But but anyway, man, yeah, I loved wrestling from day one. We got we got to go into the wrestling coliseum Friday nights, hung around long enough, and I, we made it uh, clear to Paul, Mr. Bosch, Paul Bosch, uh, I want to wrestle. You can't wrestle, you're too small. So I kept going, going. I started working in the wrestling office in Houston, during the summer. Well, actually, let me back up. I started taking pictures when I was 12 at ringside. My brother, Ken, uh, who just passed away earlier this year, he's the one who called Paul and got me this uh, meeting when I was just a kid in his office. He picked me up from school, took me down, told me what he did. And I said, oh, man. So I started taking pictures for Wrestling News, Jim Melmy, Norm Keitzer, uh, Gong Magazine. Some of that stuff was published. Um uh, a lot of that stuff was published and, and Paul let me go to that, down to ringside. So he saw me every week. I brought him some of the stuff that got published. So he knew I wasn't just playing around. And, uh, I, I remember seeing Gino Hernandez growing up there too. Gino was like three years older than me. Uh, and Gino, uh, would be a second sometimes when either Pat Hatchell or Tommy Fouché would go on vacation. Back then they actually had the seconds walk to the ring, take the jackets back. And uh, so I said, I I would really like to be able to do that next time. Uh, one of those guys goes on vacation. And what do you know? A couple months later, Paul said, would you like to be a second? Well, 
gosh almighty of course so i uh i got to do that and then when i was uh 15 i had my learner's permit and uh i my brother got me a job at montgomery ward selling shoes good god almighty man after like three weeks uh i'm in the ticket office and i'm talking to the ladies behind the counter and i'm telling them about this job and how horrible it is and paul walks had walked out of his office and he came over he said uh, that job is going to give you stories for a lifetime how would you like to work here now i know that sounds crazy but he we i had helped bruce and i actually helped him move from his office at 2022 San Jacinto at the corner of grade and 1919 Carolina on the corner of Pierce. That's how I plugged it on the show each week. So we had already moved, moved into a new office. Uh, he was anyway, he offered me the gig 75 bucks a week. So during the summertime, I got to work in the office, see the guys come in, you know, Friday morning, go over the booking meeting and all this other stuff. He was, didn't smarten me up. He kayfabe me, but, he was letting me see how it was working. Yeah. And if anybody needed to go somewhere, uh, I was got to take them or run errands and, and mow the grass. And it was just, I was at the right place at the right time. So, uh, while all this is going on, I mean, I, I'm working out with Mark Lewin, if that gives you any idea about some of my mentors, Mark was living in Houston, Texas off telephone road, which affectionately would be known these days probably as the hood. And, uh, you know, but, but he had, he had a, like a two bedroom apartment with his 86 year old dad and his wife and, and three kids. And I'm thinking, why is this big star <laughs> living in this apartment right. in Houston, Texas? Mark was a star since he was a kid too. He was 16 years old or whatever it was. His, his, his Danny McShane married his sister and all this other crazy stuff, but I didn't really understand the, you know, why Mark couldn't get booked anywhere else. You know, he was working just Houston and we were going to the gym every night and I'm, I'm scratching my head, but I really wasn't sure. I didn't really understand. Boy, do I understand now? <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. But, um, so that's, that's kind of how, uh, I, I, I had a, I developed a love for it. And when I got working in the office, I never wanted to be an office guy, but it, it intrigued me, the behind the scenes stuff that went on. And um, from there, it, it, it just, I never stopped. And uh, so finally I got an opportunity. What did your uh, parents, I know they took you there originally, but what did they think about you starting like in the office at that, at that young age? Did they well, have well, reservations my, on that? Yeah. Yeah. My mom took us. My dad didn't. My dad okay. didn't, have any, didn't have anything to do with Russell. He didn't. Okay. That. My gotcha. mom was wanting to get out of the house. I see. I think away from my dad. Okay. And uh, yeah. So, but, but, you know, mom, my mom uh, just thought it was a passing phase and we were just going to have a good time like everybody else. But then when they saw that I was uh, taking pictures and getting them published and, and I'm actually doing stuff then I, I finally wound up, by the way, sitting ringside with Paul uh, as his assistant. If you go back and look at some of those old NWA matches, in fact, we watch Harley Race versus Terry Funk from 1977 in Houston, right after uh, Harley won the title from Terry in Toronto. I'm sitting ringside with Paul. You can see my, oh, wow. you know, so all those NWA sh uh, shows on YouTube, I'm going, whoa, they're out. We're sitting ringside. <laughs> so once I started wrestling, Bruce started as Paul's assistant, Bruce came up behind me in the office and announcing and things like that. So my mom and dad both really just, yeah, you know, it's some crazy dream. You'll never do it. Cause you're not big enough. You, you're yeah. too small. So, but, and everybody around me said the same thing. So I was determined. I heard something when I was 12 years old that stuck with me. Uh, I used to take karate, had a really great karate instructor, sensei, Bill Gray. And he brought a guy to class who did a seminar one time for Amway. Remember Amway? Oh, yeah, yeah, for of sure. Of course. Well, he said there's three kinds of people in this world. This is what's this is what really hit me. He said, those who try, when they don't make it, at least they tried. They say at least they tried. And those that say, uh, well, I'll give them my best shot. And when they don't make it, they say, well, at least you gave them my best shot. 
And then there's a third kind of person who says, whatever it takes. And I thought, whoa, why are these guys able to do it? And people saying I can't be because they're going to do whatever it takes. Well, if it took going to the gym with Mark Lewin, if it took doing whatever I had to do, well, I'm going to do whatever I had to do because I don't see any difference between them and me, except the fact that now they're doing what I want to do. And, and why can't I do what I want to do? Because I want to do it. Right. So That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. You guys are probably about the, about the same size, right? You, probably. Did you, got, did you have that coming in too? The same people telling you you were too small? No, I didn't have anybody tell me anything because Tommy, he lived the greatest fucking life in the world being a teenager, yeah. hanging out in pro wrestling with guys that knew the business and just hanging around there. It's going to, he'd be, I'd be happy every fucking minute I was oh, there. Oh, I was. I was happy every, every freaking minute. You're, I you're was. talking to these stars you've seen in the magazines. You watch them on TV and you're somebody. And you, and that's the only world you're somebody in is that world right there. It's it. That's, this is, I'm getting, I'm getting the goosebumps on this son of a bitch. Here I am living in goddamn Seymour, Indiana. Don't know anybody about wrestling. Start my fucking career. I'm not even smart. Don't know anything. And then you've lived. I'm, I'm looking at this. I said, and I'm a, so I'm a jealous motherfucker going, God damn. What a fuck. Holy shit. Hey, I got memories nothing. and stories yeah. you must have. Yeah. I Holy got nothing, shit. Nothing, nothing to complain about. I, it was, it really was looking back on it. Yeah, I I was so fortunate and grateful for what happened, and then so happy. I, I, I can't. I have nothing to complain about. Really, when I wake up every day, even even when it's a bad day, it's a great day. So yeah, yeah, I agree, man. I I'm, I was very fortunate. So I, I don't take anything for granted. Your thing was nothing about the money. Nothing. Nothing. No. Nothing about money. Yeah. It was all you. Was just. Like a, a pig in shit. You was, just, yeah. you was just loving it. You know, he's probably you, jacking off, getting ready. I can't. I, 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 I'm coming in two hours early and staying. I'm going to sleep on the couch tonight, you know, or whatever. I, but, uh, yeah, I didn't mind staying late. I didn't mind coming in early for anything, man. So it was, uh, uh, it, it was a dream come true, but I had no idea what I had at the time. I had no idea the knowledge with Mark Lewin. I had no idea. I mean, I knew what a big star Mark was and we would talk, but I didn't want to be that Mark. I didn't want to be that guy that was going to bug Mark about everything about wrestling, but I wanted to so bad, but I, and, and Rip, you know, Mark, you know, his, his, uh, his habits is, yep. uh, workout habits, his pre-workout habits and things like this. So, you know, he taught me though, he taught me those along the way. And I was around Brody for a lot, uh, a little bit, not a mm -hmm. lot, but for times that, you know, I would see the, the, the mood, the attitude and everything those guys uh, brought with it when they came in the locker room. And I was looking at all these cartoon characters who were larger than life. And, uh, so now I'm, I'm repeat part of that, it. Tommy. What's that? Larger than life characters. That, this yes. is what wrestling was. Yes. It wasn't the shithole that exists now of guys no. doing flips, looking like skinny, fat nerds. The, everybody had a presence and we right. didn't give a shit what kind of move you did. If it didn't beat you, it wasn't any good anyway. Right. <laughs> right. God. But these guys, but these guys, uh, it, it was a different era. No internet, no, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I truly believe the dirt sheets have been around a lot longer. Well, they've been around a lot longer than Dave Meltzer. Cause I, I, there was a guy named Ron Dobrat who used to write stuff too. And I would try and get all the information I could from the wrestling magazines. You used to have pen pals back then and you yep. write and get, 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 uh, uh, results and newspaper clippings from different parts of the country and things like this. Well, you know, you you could do an angle like this is this is pretty much how it smartened me up. You could do an angle in in El Paso, let's say, and then the same angle in Houston, and uh, uh, 
nobody would know about it, but now everybody knows instantly. But the, it, Harley Race and Grizzly Smith did an angle in, in El Paso right before we moved to Houston. When we moved to Houston, come to find out, Johnny Valentine and Grizz had done the same angle. And I asked Grizz about it. And he says, yeah, I had a six-week tour to Japan, so they, they beat or hurt me and sent me out and came back and he did the rematches. So I finally got to meet all these guys <clears throat> that I grew up uh, you're right in the magazines, but grew up watching, idolizing. And, um, so it was, it was that larger than life circus persona. I met Dr. Jerry Graham in Los Angeles when I first went out there. You talk about a, a character. You talk about a guy who used to like the cigars with hundred dollar bills. I mean, how, who does that? He does that. And and those people do that. So to meet this legendary mythological figure, you're going, holy smoke. And the guys, you're right. The guy, it was a slower pace, yes, but it was a more believable pace. When Johnny Valentine hit you, man, how was it ringside for so many Johnny Valentine? When I say ringside, I'm talking at the ring, taking the pictures. And the sweat would fly or the spit would get on you. And uh, you'd see the welts come up immediately, and then you'd see a hole, and there's no daylight in there. It's all this uh, authentic realism, and they weren't playing. Johnny Valentine was a bad dude. He 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 just oozed something about him you didn't want to mess with because he was mysterious. He didn't uh, didn't laugh a lot. Uh, you know, Wahoo McDaniel was a heavy-handed, hot-handed, hot-headed Indian. And when he chopped you, man, he chopped these guys. And and it was just a lot more uh, buzz in the air when they turned the house lights down and you could still smoke in the arena oh, and the, yeah. smoke would, the smoke would get in the ring lights. And, and as a kid, I saw fights break out all the time in the crowd. And I'm going, oh, my God. And – it was incredible. It just, it, it, I was infected with it and I still haven't got it out of me. Yeah, that's awesome. So how about they going from the front row and, and ringside taking pictures and it's starting to get into the ring. So did you have, did you learn on the fly? Did you have training sessions? I, I know I looked, I looked at some stuff online, which never is, you know, hundred percent true, but looked like you went out and trained with uh, judo Jean LaBelle a little bit as well, which we just talked about on this show a few weeks ago. <laughs> No, I never, I never trained with Gene. I knew Gene in LA. Okay. Uh, that was my first territory. Gary, uh, that's a whole different deal too. But <laughs> Gary, Gary Hart had sent me out there. Um, I was supposed to go to Portland first, but no, I, when I was working in the office during, during the summer, uh, a football player and occasionally football players or other athletes would come and uh, ask Paul if he, they could break in. Well, during this time, a guy by the name of Mohammed Farouk, Khazro Bazuri, the Iron Sheik. He was working as Mohammed Farouk yep. in the area, in the territory. And a uh, football player wanted to train. So this was one of the summers I was working in the office. Uh, Gary Hart and Sheik had come in for the booking, off, booking meeting Friday morning. Uh, Paul came out and said, you know, you can take these guys to the Coliseum. You know, it'd be Cosro and the football player. And a good wrestler always brings his gear. So I always brought gym gear just in case. And I had my gear. He goes, if you want to get in there with him, you can. So now at this time, while I've been working in the office and I'm Paul's assistant sitting at ringside, they never let me go in the dressing room. They hadn't let me go in the dressing oh. room yet. So I wasn't, didn't know what it was. Sounds like rip. Right. Well, exactly. That's how it kind of starts. They would let me in the in the dressing they, room ever. <laughs> yeah. They well, they test you. They mm -hmm. test you to see. You know, we don't want this kid hanging around. You're going to smarten everybody up. We don't want to smarten him up. We don't smart. That kayfabe meant something back then. It was a little more sacred. And I, when people say that word, a lot of people go, "Oh, you guys did all that other crap." Yeah. Nobody knows what they're talking about unless you were there. And kayfabe meant so much more back then. They took it. They took it seriously. The boy, the guys took their business seriously. And if you didn't belong in that fraternity, if you didn't belong in the back, you weren't going to get in. So now I'm going to get to take the Iron Sheik, well, Kazra or Mohammed Farouk, like, and oh. this football player in. We're going to go in the in the dressing room of the Coliseum now. So we walk in, and I'm getting ready for Sheiky Baby to put on his curl toe boots. 
you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and put on those tights with the camel on them. And we get in there, I look and it's, it's just a bit one big room. And, uh, I, I know you were in Houston rip, but you probably dressed in the hockey dressing room. Well, yeah, yeah, there was two, two dressing rooms. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, there was a hockey dressing room. Then there was the other old school dressing room. Okay. They had three. There was another old, old school dressing room where you go downstairs. Um, but anyway, we were in the new one and, uh, I looked around and said, oh, okay. And then I see uh, old Cosro take out his singlet uh -huh. and his amateur wrestling shoes. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I went, hmm, well, <laughs> maybe. Let me go to the ring. It's already set up. And uh, we do 100 squats and 100 push-ups uh -huh. just to warm up. And this football player is kind of cocky, and he already knows this is all the work, and he's already got it down, all this all phony, and I'm a, I'm a big, bad football player. And I could kind of sense that. And I, I could sense a little bit of, of aggravation on uh, Ocasio's face, but I wasn't sure, but I soon found out. So, uh, yeah. So we do the squats, do the push-ups, we're warmed up. And he says, okay, now you're going to try turning me over, okay? You turn me over. I get my old force, you get down, you turn me over, okay? I've never amateur rest in my life. I'm about a buck 60. I'm freaking 16 years old. Oh, my God. So, but here's my opportunity to show him what I can do. Well, I get, he turtles on me. I can't budge you. He's like a good solid 245 at this point. So he goes, now I do you. Okay, you'll <laughs> get down all fours. And to this day, I still don't know what he put me in, what hole, except I'm on my stomach. He's stretching the hell out of me, pulling me back and go, now scream. And I'm going, okay. He goes, no, louder, louder. I said, okay, okay, okay. And he pushes me off. I went, all right. So, so awesome. then he gets does it to the football player, and same thing. He goes, "Okay, okay, scream, okay, okay, yeah, all right." So, anyway, we we do this um, about three weeks in a row. He comes with Gary for the morning, and Paul, I'm sure, is paying him for coming in early to help this guy out. And then after that, the football player says, eh, "I don't want any more of this." Because they're not smarting him up. They're not telling him how to work. Kind of like Rip said. He wasn't smart when he had his first match. They're not going to do this to a guy. Come in and say, hey, here's how it works. And I didn't care. I was willing to do whatever it took. You're going to have to beat me out of it. You're going to have to. You were going to have to make me quit. And I, I wasn't going to quit. I, I refuse, no matter what you did. So uh, after that, Nick Kozak and a guy named Joe Mercer had a record service. Joe used to wrestle with Joe Pizza. They had a record service in Houston, again, over on the other side of the town, uh, other side of town, which was also, they, they had a few hoods in Houston. This was just in a really not a good part of town, but they had, the, it was a place to go. Well, on one side of the ring, they had a six foot drop, uh, like a oil pit, so whatever it might be. So you don't want to go out that side of the ring. And, and he had a bunch of guys. I didn't know there was outlaw wrestling back then. Had no idea what it was. But some of those guys who've been wrestling on the other side of town and doing their own thing would be there. And then a guy named King Parsons yeah. was just starting to train too. He would drive his dump truck. He'd drive the big old truck, drive that. He'd come straight from work. That's awesome. Get out. Yeah, man. It was it was awesome. It really it, was. His first his first territory was Port. He come into Portland yes. when I was there. Yeah, well, that was supposed to be my first territory. Uh -huh. In Houston, they'd call, so, you know, go to Portland. Yeah. Sidetracked in L.A. But, yeah, his first first territory was. But I remember uh, I'd go to his house, too, sometimes. And we'd work out. At, he'd have the bench right in his front room. Yeah. <laughs> benches and do curls. Yeah. Uh, dumbbells and things like that. So, that that's, yeah, I, I started training that way. And then – uh Paul got me booked in Portland and uh, Gary Hart came to me like a week or a, the night before I left, whenever it was. I said, uh, you're, you're going to LA. You, you're going to, I said, Gary, I'm, I'm booked in Portland. He goes, no, no, no. You're going to go here first. Then you're going to go to Portland. I said, okay. And I just figured back then Gary and Paul had talked. Well, little did I know. No, they didn't. And nobody, <laughs> Paul, Don Owen was expecting me. I, I thought they took care of it. I didn't know it was up to me. 
Well, Chavo Guerrero was a booker in L.A. when I got there the first time. Uh, you know, Chavo, uh, Chavo was great. They needed talent. Nobody wanted to work in L.A. I'm, you know, looking back on it, I know now. But as a young 20-year-old kid, my goodness, the Olympic Auditorium, famous, they call it the Madison Square Garden of the West Coast. You know, I'm wrestling this big ring. I've seen in the magazines. All, you know, yeah. Was I a mark? I'm still a mark. I still love the business. I still, I still look at it like, holy Christ, I can't believe I was fortunate enough to do it. So I'm in the, in the ring. It's a cool place. I got Hollywood right next to me. I'm living in Van Nuys. I'm, I'm, I'm experiencing stuff that, uh, I knew I wanted to experience. I never knew I'd have the opportunity, but I did. It was great. And you're 20 years old, 20 years old, Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. It's like a movie. It is. It really is a lot. Of, there's a lot of stuff like a movie in this life. Rip. I think you got a movie in there too. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can call it a horror story or murder mystery. We don't know. So, I mean, they had magazines and stuff, obviously, but did you know, I mean, cause you were always in the same place for growing up and in the office and stuff. Did you know that was kind of the next step going to territories? Did you? Oh did, yeah. You did. I wanted to, I, I, I wanted to travel. I wanted to go to, to Japan. I wanted to go to Australia. I wanted to go all these exotic places I had heard about. I, I, and I haven't got to go to Australia yet, but Japan, I, I've been to, I, I think five times I've lost count, but uh, I got to, to live out a lot of these dreams. I never would have got to live out without wrestling, but, England, Germany, all these foreign countries you go and and uh, uh, you're wrestling. You get paid to go there. And it's like, my God, does it get any better than that? No, it doesn't because you get to go out and perform. You get to go out and have fun. You get to talk in the locker room, tell these outrageous lies and stories and have fun just in interacting. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, Bobby Jaggers was one of the Oh, my God. Yes, one of the greatest storytellers of all time. But you knew he, he was full of shit. You you <laughs> knew he didn't yeah. really ha he you knew you knew his Porsche was not in South Africa right. and he, you knew his his uh, ranch in Dunlop Kansas with the one cow that was crippled I mean he didn't yeah. have the thousand head of cattle like he said yeah but but it was great listening to <laughs> oh yeah the the trips were just God that's yeah. where you got your education you had the most yes. fun making the trips with the boys because yes. you know nothing that comes out of their mouth is was true it was all a rib. Right, but you but but wrestling is storytelling, and storytelling comes from hearing stories and telling stories outside the ring, inside the ring, but but all around it, man. It was just this it wasn't a job, it was just a pleasure to go to go and do this stuff. I mean, it it wasn't all you know fluffy ducks all the time, but but at the same time, you wouldn't want to do anything else. Even if you're making 30 bucks, 40 bucks, whatever it was, it, Rip said it earlier, it's not about the money. It was about going out there and doing what your heart was telling you to do. Rip's always talked about the travel, seeing the world, going to different countries, territories. It's yeah. always kind of been your... Yeah, yeah. because well, you're... It's, it's just, you've only got so much time in life. I told the doctor who I was in today for the thing on my foot, but I said... Hey, uh, I've pretty much done everything on my bucket list. Yeah, me too. No, me too. and I have like WWD. I, I, I don't give a fuck. Right. AEW. I don't give a fuck. I yeah, don't give a fucking point. shit. You know no. the stories, the, the shit I got up here, the stories, the thinking about the fucking trips. It's like I'd be riding in the fucking car with fucking Randy, me and him, and him fucking yelling and screaming for no reason. Yeah. Or that I, I'm it's with. Fun. Or I'm with the, the uh, with the bushwhackers. They're driving. Me and Buddy Rose is in the back. I'm shitting in the in the mason jar and putting in back a Luke. Oh fuck, mate! Oh, oh, you, you're fought, you're fighting again, mate! You're fighting again. It's, yeah. No matter where you went, it was just every day was a holiday. It was yeah. just unbelievable. You're happy every day. Yeah. What am I doing? Well, I'm training and I'm eating good. And then I'm going to go out and go with these, the coolest, the coolest cartoon characters in the world. We're going to have fun. We're going to work. Then we're going to, they're going to get drunk. I'm going to listen to their stories all the way back. Probably shut up a lot of times. Cause I was in, 
as soon as I opened my mouth, they knew I was an idiot. So I tried not to open it that much. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Dr. Too. Tom, we're under a minute. We I started recording a little late because we were chatting a little bit. Can I send you a new link? Can we can we get on sure. and Big gold and a bill fold so swole that I can't get the shit closed. So I money fold and rubber band wrap. And when it pop, bitches sound like a hand clap. Grown man rap.